Okay. Well, good morning. Today we're going to continue in the Gospel of John, uh, still in chapter 5. We're going to be starting in verse 16. So let us pray. Dear Father, we just thank you for this time we can spend together. We can go through your word. We thank you for the things that Jesus is telling us about himself. And we ask you to, that we may learn from that and appreciate even better who he is, that he is the Messiah and the Son of God and our Savior. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, for some background information, and to give credit where credit might be due, as I gleaned this information from Bob Diffenbaugh's The Gospel of John, because he just said it so well, but I kind of changed it a little bit. But until now, Jesus had been keeping a relatively low profile. He'd been very reluctant to draw a lot of attention to himself too quickly. Chapter 1, or in chapter 2, when he turned the water into wine, he did it quietly. Only his disciples and the servants knew what happened, and, and the disciples are said to have believed as a result of the miracle. The cleansing of the temple was more public and even caught the attention of the Pharisees, but it didn't attract a large group of followers. The other signs he performed did attract some followers and believers, but these were only sign faith believers, and Jesus kept his distance from them. His meeting with Nicodemus was private in chapter 3, and his meeting with the Samaritan woman and ministry to the Samaritans in chapter 4 had little or no impact on the Jews who looked upon the Samaritans as, as, uh, with disdain. The healing of the royal official's son, recorded in chapter 4, was accomplished in a way that it was not seen by the crowds. He rebuked the sign seekers and refused to go with the father to heal his son. So he healed him from a distance. And only the father and his family came to believe. Then we have the healing of the man at the pool, which was done quietly. He was one man. There's all kinds of other people around there who were sick, but he went up to this one man quietly. And after healing the man, he kind of disappeared into the crowd. However, later this sign did bring some considerable attention. The healed man is quickly intercepted by the Jews who accused him of violating the Sabbath by carrying his bed on the Sabbath day. Then the man justifies himself by laying the responsibility on the one who healed him. But when pressed to identify this lawbreaker, he's unable to give him the Lord's name, for he never even found out who he was. When Jesus later finds the man in the temple, he admonishes him uh, to forsake his sin, lest the worst condition come upon him. There's no indication of repentance on this man's part, no mention of gratitude. Instead, he goes, seeks out the authorities so that he can identify Jesus as the villain. Once Jesus is identified as the culprit, it prompted the Jewish leaders, religious leaders to view Jesus as a notorious criminal deserving the death penalty. So they began to wage an attack against him. So now in Jesus' ministry, the battle begins. Let's start with verse 16. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. But Jesus had done two things on that Sabbath. He had healed a man, and then he told the man to pick up his pallet. Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it was because of these things being done on the Sabbath that the Jews were persecuting Jesus. And this is the first 
recorded incident of Jesus charged with breaking the Sabbath in John's Gospel, and only John records this incident. The other three Gospels, they begin with the fir their first incident when the disciples are walking through the grain field and they pick and they eat some of the heads of the grain. And this is found in Matthew 12, Mark 2, and Luke 6. And since no gospel recorded both events, um, there's differences of opinion out there whether the healing of the man at the pool or the picking of the, and eating of the grain, which one happened first? Um, but anyway, he was attacked in public and the persecution most likely considered a a whole lot of questions and accusations and, you know, hollering, yelling at him. The Sabbath law is the fourth commandment. Let's take a look at it. In Exodus 20, starting in verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it you shall not do any work. <clears throat> you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or the sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this fourth commandment requires the people of God to imitate God who rested on the seventh day of creation. The logic is simple. God rested on the seventh day, and so must men. And there's a penalty for breaking the Sabbath. In Exodus 31, 14, we see, Therefore you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does not work on it, that person shall be cut off from among the people. So the penalty for breaking the Sabbath is death. But some manuscripts in uh, verse uh, 16 have added the phrase and sought to slay him in verse 16. They were per persecuting Jesus and sought to slay him. And this shows up in the King James and New King James translations. And whether it belongs there or not doesn't really make a difference to the story. The Jewish leaders were already put out by Jesus, and they wanted to get rid of him somehow. And now they had a reason. And when they found, when they realized that this reason involved breaking the Sabbath, then it would have been normal for them to seek, seek, seek him out to uh, to punish him, to kill him. Uh, however, Jesus answered their charge against him. He said, "My Father is working until now, and I myself am working." Jesus argues that God is constantly at work, even on the Sabbath, and since God is working nonstop, the Son is also working and, and cannot cease for the Sabbath. Jesus uh, knows that the Sabbath was for men to rest. God rested from his creative work, but continues to work in his creation. Carson, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, states, the rabbis regarded God as working on the Sabbath by simply maintaining the universe and continuing to impart life. They didn't accuse God of violating the Sabbath even though he was continuing to work. And Jesus viewed God as constantly at work. He says, my father is working until now. Jesus claimed to be doing what God was doing. I myself am working. God did not suspend his, all activities on the Sabbath, and neither did Jesus. In Mark, Jesus taught in chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, and he was saying to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Consequently, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And that's also found in Luke 6, 5. Well, this story is not found in the other Gospels, and John included this story in his Gospel because it serves his purpose to prove what? Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Jesus' response here in John is not found in the other Gospel accounts of him 
breaking the Sabbath. And in his answer to the Jews, Jesus is actually identifying himself as the Son of God. God was his Father, and he is in effect saying that he is God. As God, he has a right to heal on the Sabbath. So instead of correcting the prevailing view of the Jews on the Sabbath, Jesus made a statement of his equality with the Father. The same factors that applied to God were also his. Jesus' work of healing was the work of God. The Father works every moment on behalf of his creation, and so does his Son. And in verse 18, for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. So the Jews immediately understood what Jesus said about himself. For these Jewish leaders, it was bad enough for Jesus to heal on the Sabbath, but for him to claim deity as the son of the father, that was treason. And this passage is the first reference to the Jews' desire to kill Jesus. And their conflict with Jews, Jesus began to escalate from this point on. But he continued his response to the Jews in verses 19 to 30. But before we go there, let's look at a summation of Jesus' teaching about himself. Uh, so Jesus is uh, noticed for making himself equal with God. So Jesus is going to claim equality with God in seven ways. In verse 19, equal in the way, God, the way they work. In uh, verse 20, they're equal in what they know. Verse 21, 28, and 29 talks about their equal, being equal in the ability to raise from the dead. Verse 22, 27, and 30, they're equal in judging. 23, they're equal in honor and glory. And in verse 24, 25, they're equal in the ability to give eternal life. And in 26, they're equal in being self-existent. So notice that Jesus is equal to the Father as he is fully God. But while he's on the earth, he's also fully man and will depend upon his Father to continuously reveal things and provide for him. For example, in the knowing, Jesus is omniscient as God, but as man, he learns from the Father. He looks to see what the Father's doing, and then he does it. <coughs> Verse 19. <coughs> Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, and that is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. So it begins with, truly, truly, I say to you. And this tells us that the words that he's about to say are vitally important, both to be heard and to be heeded. So the first way that he's equal to God is in his working in creation. For the Son can do nothing of himself means that Jesus is totally dependent upon the Father. The Son is subordinate to the Father. He receives authority from the Father. He obeys him and executes his will. Jesus, in being, is, is such close contact in his relationship with his Father, knows what his Father's will is, and he carries it out. Both the Father and the Son have one purpose, and they worked that purpose in unison. Their activities were in perfect harmony. Jesus was the agent on earth for whatever needed to be done. His equality with the Father is in his divinity. <coughs> his actual work on earth is a continuous seeing what the Father is doing. He is omniscient as God, but as man he's constantly learning. In verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. So Jesus next clarified why he could do whatever the Father does. He could do so because the Father loves him. Because the Father loves the Son, the Father 
continues to show the Son all the things that the Father is doing. So Jesus is equal to the Father in his knowing what the Father does. Jesus knows what the Father is doing in creation. The Father will continue to show him greater things than these even in order that they will marvel. The greater works than these are the later works um, that are going to be greater than the healing of the man and commanding him to carry his pallet. This continuous revelation of the Father's works is another example of the Father's love. His Father is with him and not leaving him on his own. Remembering here that Jesus is fully God and fully man, as God, Jesus already knows all because he's omniscient. But as man, he knows as his Father reveals things to him. While on earth he lives and works as a man led by his Father in heaven. And this is an example of how we are to live as children of God in a life of total dependence upon God. We need to learn what God's will is and walk in his will. We need to abide in Christ so that we can bear his fruit. Verse 21, for just as the Father raised the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. So one of the greater things that the Father will show Jesus is that, is that he is to give life to whom he wishes. Just as the Father raises from the dead, so does the Son. And this is far greater than the healing of the man at the pool. And later we're going to see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. This is the third way in which Jesus is equal to his Father. He gives life to whom he wishes. The Son's will is so identical to the Father's will that his choices reflect the Father's will. Eternal spiritual life and resurrected physical life are both in view, as we see, uh, as we're going to see in verses 28 and 29. Verses 22 to 23, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So the Father and Son, they both give life, but the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. And this is new to the Jews, because they held that the Father was the judge of all people, and they expected to stand before him on that last day. They believe this in spite of what Daniel teaches. In, verses, uh, in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, where he says, I keep looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man is coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. <coughs> And to him was given dominion, glory, and kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So Jesus is the Son of Man in this passage of Daniel, and the Ancient of Days would be the Father. And if Jews remembered this passage in Daniel, they would have understood that Jesus was claiming to be this Son of Man. We will see this exact claim again in verse 27. In verse 27, it says, He gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Back to 22, though, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all who will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So the Son is equal to the Father in judging, because he has the Father's authority to judge. So this is the fourth way in that he's equal to the Father. In verse 23, we see the reason the Father has delegated judging to the Son so that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. Subordination usually results in less honor. The Father has guaranteed that the Son will receive equal honor with himself by committing the role of judging entirely to him. 
Therefore, failure to honor the Son reflects failure to honor the Father. Conversely, honoring the Son honors the Father. So we see that in, in Isaiah 42, 8, says we see that God will not share his honor with another. Consequently, for him to share his honor with the Son must mean that the Son and the Father are equal with one another. Verse 24 and 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So the sixth way in Jesus is equal to the Father is in giving eternal life. And he begins both these verses with, Truly, truly, I say to you. So this is very important, and you must listen and believe. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me. So if one honors the Son as he honors the Father, he will hear the Son and believe the Father. Hearing and believing Jesus is the same as hearing and believing the Father who sent him. Constable states, The Son represents the Father to humankind. So when we place faith in the Son, we're actually placing our faith into the Father as well. Jesus was talking about giving life to whomever he wishes. And he was has talked about his being judge of all men. Those who hear Jesus' words and therefore believe God who sent him will receive eternal life and will not come under judgment. Jesus says, has eternal life. And in this place, this is the present tense. This is one of those places where it is actually the present tense. Whereas eternal life is something that believers look forward to in the future, believers also already have it in the present. People actually pass from one realm, death, into another realm, life, the moment that they believe. We see this passing from one realm to another in verse 25, where it says, Truly, truly, I'd say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So an hour is coming and now is. This points to both future and present aspects of eternal life. Believers will experience in the future fully which they already experience now, partially, namely the resurrection life. They will experience it in the future physically, but they experience it now spiritually. Jesus' word gives believers spiritual life now, and it will, his word will actually raise them from the dead in the future. Therefore, the believer's basis of eternal security and his or her assurance of eternal life both rest on the promise of the Son. To have eternal life now is to be secure throughout eternity. From 24 to 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of life, death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Verse 26 continues the subject of verses 24 and 25, but adds the reason. This brings us to the seventh way that Jesus is equal to the Father. They both have self-existence. Eternal life resides in the Father and also in the Son. They both are life. They both are the source of eternal life. Verse 27, and he gave them authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. 
It says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which we are all in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So the authority over life and death are in the Father and also in the Son because the Father gave him this authority. There, the Son has in himself to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man, referring back to Daniel 7, which we've already seen. This authority to execute judgment is authority over all the earth. The Father has made him king of the world. This, of course, refers to the future millennial kingdom. Jesus will exercise this judgment in the future when all will hear his voice. There will be a time in the future when all the bodily dead will hear the voice of Jesus. Jesus will rose, raise both the just dead and the unjust dead. The just dead will move into eternal life with God, and the unjust will go into eternal condemnation. The idea here is not that one has to do good to get into heaven. The good here is the byproduct of salvation. The word good means excellent. It is the good things that spring from faith. These words do not teach salvation by good works. The entire argument of the Gospel of John asserts that a person is saved by what he or she believes. Likewise, the word committed evil do not imply loss of salvation simply by committing evil deeds. The word for evil here is not necessarily moral evil, but deeds that are worthless or good for nothing. It's an evil or worthless life not to trust in Christ. For salvation. In verse 30, I can do nothing of my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So verse 30 finishes the argument from verse to start in verse 19 and transitions to the last section of the discourse, which we'll look at next week, um, where Jesus shifts to the first person, I, instead of talking to himself about himself in the second person. Some ask why Jesus could do nothing of himself. Is not Jesus God? How could God limit himself? Well, he must distinguish between the deity and the humanity of Christ. Jesus made this statement from the viewpoint of his humanity. When the Son became a man, he limited his, his divine attributes so that he could truly function as a human being. The Son did the Father's will as a genuine man. Jesus was unique in that he was truly human, but also diminished deities simultaneously. The Father and Son's relationship was so united that Jesus did not act by himself. He never did anything on his own authority. And this is no argument against the deity of Christ, for Christ never violated consistency with the Father in his humanity. He says, as I hear, I judge. Jesus' judgment always rests on what he hears from the Father. He never deviates from the will of God. His judgment is just because he never seeks his own will, but only his Father's will. <coughs> Constable quotes Stephen Kim and saying, this is the most thorough statement of Jesus' unity with the Father. Divine commission, authority, and proof of Messiahship in the Gospels. Jesus moved from clarifying his relationship to the Father to explaining his function as the judge of the humanity, to citing the witnesses that established his claims. And remember John's purpose for his Gospel. John 20, 31, but though these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John's gospel provides us with some of the greatest statements of Jesus and the greatest proofs of who he is, the Messiah and the Son of God. As fully God, Jesus is totally equal with God. As fully man while on earth, he is equal as needed because he is so in tune with and totally dependent upon his father. This is why he can say to Philip, 
If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And in this section of chapter 5, he made claims that he is God. In the rest of the chapter, he's going to present witnesses that back up his complaints. Witnesses that will give testimony. And we'll cover these witnesses next week. <coughs> the thought came to me later, actually this morning, I'll just talk about, I'm going to be judging all the people of the earth. Consider who he's talking to. Those who are wanting to put him to death. Kind of makes you wonder if they actually were listening to what he was saying. Or if they were, did they even, they, they just didn't care. I mean, he, he was, they were rejecting him as telling him the truth. But someday, he's going to be speaking to these very same people. And then they will understand. They will believe that it will be too late. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for John's message and for using him to show the world that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him we can have eternal life. Jesus has revealed to us the relationship of total dependency he has with the Father. And we can see this as an example for us to emulate as we should be in a relation of total dependence with Jesus. As we learn to walk in him, as we learn to abide in him, we can bear his fruit. Please continue to mold us more and more into the image of your son so that others can see Christ in us. We thank you for your patience and for your grace and love and the power and authority of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>